even the most careful and the most cunning of human plans can't succeed if God opposes them. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts and minds and lead us to repentance and to growth in faith. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Please take a seat and turn to Acts chapter 23, verses 12 to 35 on page 932 of the Bibles as we look at the plot against Paul and what it teaches us today. And there's a sermon outline with some gaps for you to fill in to keep you focused on this uh, warmish evening. Well, look first at verse 12 of Acts 23. When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath, neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And the first point that the plot against Paul teaches us is that, as Jesus said, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus was plotted against. The apostles were plotted against. And Christian disciples today, and therefore the Christian message itself, will face plots and persecutions. Including, it would appear, plots. And yes, we have to be as wise as serpents, as well as gentle as doves, against Christian ethics and education. So we must act but also pray, because ultimately we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil, writes Paul in Ephesians chapter 6. And God is sovereign. His purposes cannot be thwarted. Despite all the plotting, the gospel keeps on spreading today, and the opportunities to tell the gospel are there such as at St. Joseph's in Benwell. As Psalm 2 verse 1 puts it, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? One or two of our missionaries have been affected by plots against the wider Christian community by Islamic extremists. One missionary known to my family in West Africa recently suffered at the hands of a plot by Al-Qaeda. To, com to kidnap him because of his gospel preaching. The gunmen surrounded him and tried to bundle him into a car. He refused, so they shot him in the head at point-blank range. Yet the person he'd been sharing the gospel with then trusted Christ and then took the message all over North Africa. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain. In the 1980s, I had the privilege of traveling with a well-known Christian speaker in the USA who'd spent a few years explaining the gospel on the radical university campuses of South America. Many times did political extremist atheists plot to stop him preaching in, in places such as Argentina. Some used to hide in the wardrobe of his hotel rooms and try to kill him by surprise. Other groups plotted outdoor surprises for him. But God protected him and led him to other universities and eventually to North American universities where he became known as the Billy Graham of the student world. As with the plots against Joseph in the Old Testament and indeed the plots against Jesus and here against Paul, the perpetrators meant evil against them. But God meant it for good. That's Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? All of which brings us to the next point 
that we learn from the plot against Paul, and that is, take courage. Jesus is with you as you go in his name. You see, let's remind ourselves of what's just happened. Look at verses 10 and 11 of chapter 23. When the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. There's a wonderful story of uh, John Bunyan, the writer of Pilgrim's Progress. A Quaker came to visit John Bunyan when he was in prison in Bedford in the 17th century. And the Quaker said to Bunyan that the Lord had sent him to visit him. But he'd been looking for Bunyan all over Europe to find the prison which he was in. John Bunyan said to him, but if the Lord had sent you, he would have told you where I was, because he knew where I was all along. Well, here the Lord knew where Paul was, and he knows where any one of us is at any one time. In times of difficulty, in times of distress, in times when circumstances seem to be against us. And the Lord comes to Paul and reassures him. He tells him that he will and must witness to Christ in Rome. And what does the Lord promise us? He promises to be with us wherever we go in his name. That's Matthew 28, verse 20. Do you believe that? Yes, Jesus promises to be with us when we need reassurance. And to be with us as we do what we must. And that is to witness to Jesus wherever we are. To be bold in standing up for him. As John Newton put it, If the Lord be with us, we have no cause of fear. His eye is upon us. His arm is over us. His, his ear is open to our prayer. His grace is sufficient. His promise is unchangeable. Yes, Jesus promises that when we step out in faith, tomorrow at work, at school, He will be right there with you, giving you not only confidence in Him for the present, but also for the future. Yes, his plans will prevail. And we need that reassurance. Paul needed that reassurance. Because look at what happens next. The Jewish conspiracy against Paul. You see, the Jews have been frustrated in their attempt to lynch Paul, and the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, hadn't been able to convict him. So more than 40 Jewish men in league with certain members of the Sanhedrin, including probably the high priest Ananias, made a plot, this is verses 12 and 13, and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Why was there so much hatred for the Apostle Paul? Why can there be so much hatred for Christians and the gospel message today? Well, this is the next point we learn from this plot. Essentially, it was Paul's love for the gospel, his love for Christ, that brought forth this animosity, hatred, and violence. You see, this was a conspiracy to kill the Apostle Paul, chiefly for what? For preaching the gospel. Simply for preaching that you are saved not by the works of the law, but by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. That's what had raised the animosity of the people. So we shouldn't be surprised when we meet opposition to the gospel. One former member of the IRA who'd been converted to Jesus Christ tried to describe the fanaticism that he'd held. He'd murdered several people, 
He planted bombs with nails and bits of shrapnel in them in order to maim people. And he said this. He said, the violence that is in the natural man, in the natural heart, in the unconverted heart towards the gospel, there's something satanic in it. Make no mistake about it. What did the plot against Paul involve? Well, look at verses 12 through to 15. The conspiracy was to have Paul brought back to court on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case along narrow streets where he could easily be intercepted and murdered before he got to court. They prevailed on the chief priest to persuade the Sanhedrin to, permission the, to petition the commander to cooperate with them. Paul, indeed, humanly speaking, was in extreme danger. But, and this is the next point we learn, even the most careful and the most cunning of human plans can't succeed if God opposes them. As Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17 says, No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed. If it's God's will, nothing can stop the St. Joseph's project going ahead. No opposition shall succeed. On this occasion, God's providential intervention involved Paul's nephew. Now who, some of you are asking? Well, all this brings me to my second heading, God's deliverance of Paul. Paul has a sister, we learn in verse 16. And as I said, a nephew. This is Paul's fourth visit to Jerusalem. But there's no mention of him visiting any family before this. Makes you wonder, are his parents still there? Paul had come from Tarsus in Cilicia as a young boy to study in Jerusalem. His family must have been extraordinarily wealthy to afford that kind of elitist education. Perhaps his family had come with him to Jerusalem. Anyway, we're now roughly around the year 57 AD, 24 years have passed since Paul's conversion. At his time of his conversion, what would his parents have thought? A waste of an education? My father used to think that when I became a parish assistant here 30 years ago. And as the son of a Pharisee, Paul would in all likelihood have been disinherited. But we're not told about that. What we do know for certain is that the news of the plot against Paul spread from Paul's nephew to Paul, from Paul to a centurion, and from the centurion to the commander, who then learned about it from the youth's own lips. Doubtless remembering Paul's Roman citizenship, the commander decided on immediate and resolute action. Do you see what this is saying? God uses extraordinary means. A young child, in this case, to accomplish his purposes. For the Apostle Paul, and for the Gospel, and therefore down the tracks for you and for me. I wonder how God brought you to Jesus Christ. What were the factors involved? I imagine there would be extraordinary little details involved. There were, for me, again, involving a sister. Not my sister, but the sister of my best friend. She, unbeknown to us, had become a Christian, and then she invited us both along to a Christian youth group in the big city, as we saw it, on a Friday night. And when you lived in a little village at the age of 14 in 1976, that was a big deal. The city on a Friday night. Little did we know that it was a Christian youth group and that through it, God would change our lives. And as some of you know, when I was 12, my mum had said to me, Jonathan, wouldn't it be nice if you became a vicar? I just laughed in her face. I really did. And said, you must be joking. That is the last thing I would ever want to do. But God had other ideas. 
And God used my best friend's big sister in that process. And unbeknown to me, also, my grandmother's prayers. And God used this little boy, this nephew of Paul's, despite any family animosity that there might have been towards the Apostle Paul, God used his little nephew because God had desires and God had purposes and God had work for the Apostle Paul to do. Thirdly and finally, the night flight to Caesarea. So thirdly, there's the night flight, first to Antipatris and eventually to Caesarea with 200 infantry, 200 spearmen, and 70 cavalry, 470 soldiers accompanying Paul. God is again using extraordinary means, this time the ruling pagan authorities to achieve his purposes. Now, the military HQ for Rome in Judea was actually in Caesarea. There was only a small garrison of soldiers in Jerusalem. The number of soldiers in Jerusalem was about 600. And 470 of them are being deployed to secure the safety of the Apostle Paul. The world is coming to Paul's defense for a short time. Isn't that extraordinary? Isn't there something ironic in this? Luke, no doubt, loved to write this part of Acts chapter 23. Here is mighty Rome with its crack soldiers and cavalrymen and spearmen, and they're marching down by night in order to protect who? The Apostle Paul. And Paul is given a horse to ride on and other horses perhaps for all his belongings. The mighty empire of Rome is coming to Paul's defense for a time. Their destination was Caesarea, the provincial capital of Judea, and Felix, the governor of Judea, had his residence there. Felix, a former slave, governed by virtue of the fact that he was freed by the mother of Emperor Claudius, along with his brother, who was then a favorite at the court of Claudius and then of Nero. And Felix was utterly ruthless at quashing Jewish uprising. The commander sent a letter, actually for selfish reasons, but favorable to Paul. And learning that Paul is from Cilicia, Felix was prepared to try the case when his accusers arrive. You see, according to Roman law, his accusers, his accusers must be there to face him. But you're asking, what's going on in all of this? What's happening? Well, God is in control. By his providence, he's working his purposes out in ways neither Paul nor we could imagine. And sometimes we might think, what is God doing? Do you ever think that? What is God doing? Well, he's in control. And he's working his purposes out in ways that we might have never imagined. In the end, Paul would get to Rome to witness to Christ. The gospel will be preached there. It will not be thwarted. And God has worked to provide opportunities for us to take the gospel to other parts of Tyneside in ways that we could never have imagined three months ago. The door closed on Clayton Academy, although we still remain committed to Christian education. But another door has opened at St. Joseph's. God is working his purpose out. And his gospel will not be thwarted by anyone. Not even by our coalition government. The Roman government actually helped Paul. Although Paul is under guard in Caesarea, he would be well treated as a Roman citizen and he had the reassurance that Jesus had met with him just two days before and had said that he would go to Rome. Now, it's going to take two years before he gets to Rome. God's providence is never in a hurry, is it? 
God's promises are never in a hurry. He gives us just what we need for today. And grace is like that. Do we remember that when we get frustrated? When we want God to hurry up? He gives us just what we need for today. Well, what do you think Paul was thinking at this point? Perhaps he was reflecting on a letter that he'd just written to the church in Rome just a few weeks before when he was in Corinth. And perhaps he was reflecting on something that he'd said in that letter that has been the cause of great comfort to the Lord's people ever since he wrote it. And that's at Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, which says, God works all things together for the good of those who love him, for those he called according to his purpose. And if so, there's probably one thought that's spinning through his mind as he prepares for the trial that will take place in five days' time. God is in charge here. God is in control here. Every detail, every circumstance, every set of contingencies, big things and little things, God is working out his plan. God is fulfilling his purpose. Again, do we think like that? Or do we just panic? God is in control. He is working his purpose out. And that should lead us to trust him and to pray to him. John Newton once said, there's something wrong with your head. If you think that the ark of God's sign, the rainbow, representing the promise of God, is falling from the sky, God's promises can never fail. God's purpose is always sure and certain. And Paul is probably thinking, just as he would be going on to teach the uh, believers at Philippi, I can trust him. I can trust him in the good times, and I can trust him in the bad times, and the uncertain times. Because that's the kind of God we have. What about you? Are you trusting him in the good, in the bad, in the uncertain? Because he is faithful and utterly trustworthy. Paul discovered that in Jerusalem and now in Caesarea. As the Holy Spirit had predicted, it was a tense and a difficult time in both places. The future of the gospel was at stake. Powerful forces ranged themselves for and against the gospel. And sometimes it feels like that today, doesn't it? Paul found himself trapped, unarmed and totally vulnerable. But his courage in Christ is an example to us today, especially when he stood on the, foot of the steps of the uh, fortress Antonia, facing an angry, angry crowd, which had just severely manhandled him. He stood there with no power, but with the Word and the Spirit of God. Yes, God was with him as he stood firm, and stepped out in faith. Do you know the acrostic for faith? Forsaking all, I trust him. Forsaking all, I trust him. That's what Paul did. And what was the source of Paul's courage? It was his serene confidence in the truth. He was aware that the Romans had no case against him. 
He was also convinced that the Jews had no real case against him either because his faith in Christ was the faith of his fathers and the gospel was the fulfillment of the law. Above all, he knew that his Lord and Savior was with him and would keep his promise that Paul would somehow bear witness to Christ in Rome. Do you lack courage? Well, have confidence in God, in the truth that sets you free, in the truth of God's Word, and in His promises. Remember that Jesus is with you wherever you go in His name. Be courageous. Develop that serene confidence in the truth that Paul had. You see, we may not be poor, but we all still need to go and play our part, courageously and compassionately, in making disciples of all nations, in being salt and light, in giving our time, talents, and treasure. If you're not sure where to begin, then ask God to show you. Talk to someone. The opportunity for giving and serving here, and we pray at St. Joseph's and elsewhere in the future, are there for the glory of God. Let's pray together. And let's now respond to God's Word individually in the uh, quietness Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 